Welcome to Wednesdays with Willa. On this special podcast show, we will be talking about Hilma Ofklund, a spirit communicator and artist. And on my podcast show, I typically have a special guest and we talk about a spiritual topic relating to either spiritualism, mediumship, healing, faith, family, or more. And it's always wonderful to welcome onto the show my different guests. I have today with me, Shannon Taggart. Thanks for being here today, Shannon. Thanks for having me, Willa. I'm really excited to be back with you. Yes, Shannon's been on my show before. She's a wonderful guest and she is an artist and an author. In fact, uh, she's written a book uh, called Seance that is currently out of print, but there'll be more hopefully coming. (laughs) And she's got another uh, great surprise for you a little bit later on in the show to share with you. Um, She is uh, my expert I'm calling in (laughs) to talk about uh, Hilma Ofklint, but uh, Shannon and I have known each other for, gosh, over 20 years must be, and we sat in development circles for mediumship in the past, and and Shannon has really brought a lot of her artistic talent through photography to Lilydale and uh, to many other places in the world that are interested in spirit communication. And some of the the photos that are uh, in your book are just really beautifully, um, you know, they're not staged, they're just beautifully framed the way that you have uh, designated uh, and explained some of the spiritual aspects of physical mediumship and mental mediumship and and things related to spirit contact. So I do encourage people to check shannontaggart.com out (laughs) so they can see some of those photos that are also featured in the book. And uh, you have, uh, Shannon has been uh, in Lilydale for many years also teaching and making uh, a beautiful summer presentation happen with a lot of different folks from around the world that brings their knowledge and their talents that, uh, having to do with spiritual uh, understandings to Lilydale through the summer program. So I encourage you all to take a look at that. We'll talk more about the scheduling that you can maybe register for those classes later on with Shannon Taggart and her other folks. <laughs> so um, I want to make sure that we explain to people how they can tune into Wednesdays with Willa. You can check this out on Facebook on Willa White Medium. It airs live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. You can also check out the archive videos on that Facebook page. So you can find the, the shows that I've done with Shannon in the past and enjoy the different nuances of spiritual conversation that happened with some of the other guests as well. And you can also find us on the YouTube channel for Willow White and on Blog Talk Radio. This is part of the Lilydale Radio family and there are many other Lilydale Radio shows that you can tune into on blogtalkradio.com slash Lilydale Radio. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into our topic of Hilma Ofklint, spirit communicator and artist. Take it away, Shannon. Okay, so... <laughs> First, I want to say that uh, I am not an art historian, uh, but I am an independent researcher and I am a huge fan of Hilma Afklint and have been for quite some time. And how I discovered, first uh, discovered her work is I, when I first came to Lilydale in 2001 and I went to the Lilydale Museum, I found out that there was a thing called spirit art which although I had studied art history and the history of photography very extensively, I never knew about this. And so I started to do uh, research into the topic of spirit art. And I found the work of Hilma of Clint through originally, I have some books to share. Uh, I originally found her work through this book, which is an incredible um, catalog of a show that happened in Los Angeles in 1986, which there was the first time her her work had been shown in in United. I mean, she had shown a few of her spiritual paintings in London in the 20s, but then um, it wasn't shown again until 1986. And so there's an essay about her in that catalog. So I guess I'll get starting to explain Hilma and a little bit about her life. She's a Swedish artist. 
Uh, she was born from a prominent family and she studied art at the, the Swedish Academy. She was an expert draftswoman. She did medical, um, she did, she did medical drawings. She worked at a veterinarian um, college. She did an entire book on uh, surgery for horses. So this is a person who was very studied, uh, expert artist, expert draft person. She was a, nat a naturalist as well. She did a lot of botanical drawings. She, she worked as an artist, sold her uh, nature landscape work and was a professional artist. When she was about 17, she got interested in spiritualism. Uh, it, there was, I guess, a famous spiritualist from England had come to Sweden and was doing talks and she encountered spiritualism for the first time. And then the following year, her beloved sister died, um, her younger sister. And as often as the story of spiritualism, what brings people to it is the death of a loved one. So this kind of strengthens her interest in spiritualism and theosophy. So yeah. she was also studying theosophy, which is, you know, um, started by Madame Blavatsky. It's a movement that was inspired by spiritualism, but then goes in its, its own direction. And so what Hilma does is she starts a, a home circle pretty much with four other women and they call themselves the five. And they are sitting together and getting communications and then they start to do automatic drawing in their, in their seances together, which is automatic drawing is when you let the spirits inspire your hand to draw. And so in the process of this, uh, however long, I mean, I think it's a year that they're working together in this way, uh, their spirit guides make themselves known. And I don't forget all their names, but they, they, they weren't um, personalities I had heard of before. You know, some groups have famous spirit guides. True, true. <laughs> um, so the guides announced that they are going to give the group messages for mankind and that this should be painted. And there's a kind of a tension between the group of who's going to do it. And, and the group sees it as like a huge responsibility and also a daunting task and possibly, you know, they had a healthy fear of whether it would be dangerous for their bodies even because it was so powerful. And, and around that time, people were finding that physical mediumship can sometimes be damaging for people. Yeah, and that's with ectoplasm actually, and things like that. So that was that was a thought that was going on at that time. Yeah, yeah, and that's a broader topic. I think that even continues today. You know, yes, it, it does as a sensitive and and putting yourself into that uh, understanding. But also back then, uh, there was an understanding that when you had a circle, there would usually be one person who would be the main, the medium, and then the rest would serve as batteries yes. to help to power a particular circle. So I, I think that's also par part of what was going on is to be declared that medium is a, is a great responsibility. And then other people have to serve uh, as and not necessarily be receiving, but just to help to power it through. And I, I do find it fascinating that that dynamic naturally evolves in their group, which is a classic dynamic. And it's always yes. really fascinating to see that across cultures, the same practice evolve. Yes. And so uh, Hilma takes on the task and she spends like 10 months of her life preparing she goes vegetarian. She like real. Um, she stops her other work, and she fully becomes ready to take on this download. And so then, over it's I think it's 1906. I could be wrong on my circa 1906. She takes she takes this task on, and I think it's over a two year period. Um, she makes like 193 paintings. Cool. And this um, and they weren't planned out in advance and she describes it as an act of so she's entranced when she's doing this work and as if the spirits are actually moving her hands so they are doing the physical labor through Hilma and so this is more akin to like a physical type of mediumship 
So she is just the vessel. And in some of the paintings, there's figures, uh, you know, some of them are more shapes. That, it's a really fascinating, fascinating body of work. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And I encourage everyone, and I can talk about where you can find it um, after I fill in. But in some of them, there are figures and they're not anatomically correct figures. And she, so she, her being this draft person, you know, that wouldn't be a, a way that she would draw herself. And even after when she would see the mistakes, she did not correct anything because she was so certain of uh, the direction and the download and the, the, that th this was a pure information that she should just put out. And Which is a big deal because a lot of artists is that, you know, when I, I have artists in my family and they will continue to tweak it. There's almost a perfectionist energy that can come upon artists sometimes. So that's a big deal for her to kind of put aside that and just say, this is not my, my work entirely. This is my work with spirit. That's a big deal. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so she just, she just put it forth. And so around this time, around like 1908, this is one of the most, one of the most storied events in Hilma's life is she has a meeting with Rudolf Steiner, who at the time is also a theosophist. And yes. she, he has his own way of speaking about art and uh, his own theories about color. And she brings her paintings to him and he is quite dismissive of them. And he encourages her not to do mediumistic art, to do it kind of as herself. And he doesn't understand her work. And he's put off by the fact that she doesn't fully understand her own work. And so this is kind of, I mean, no, nobody was there. So there's some true mystery as to what exactly happened but at the exact same time her mother becomes very ill and she decides to to stop painting entirely and for four years so and it's not the the project is not complete and and so for she so i think it's a combination of both but it's obvious that this um his judgment of her work definitely made an impact and I'm wondering if, because I've read R Rudolf Steiner, and I'm wondering if it's because he very strongly wants people to spiritually develop themselves. Yeah, I think there there is an intensity in his in his words about that. Yeah, so and it could have you know if she's in a sensitive state, it, she could have definitely considered that to be judgment, because he he very much wanted people to go through the spiritual development threshold. Yeah, I think um, it's hard to say, and I'm not, again, I'm not an expert and I haven't fully researched this. Um, I've heard historians, uh, I went to a conference on Hilmoff Clinton, I've heard historians surmise that he may have been intimidated and shocked and jealous because she had a fully realized system um, and he had his own system he had his own system, so I don't know that he would have been. I don't right. know. Right, but like maybe he taught as a a competing a competing system, inspired by theosophy. I've heard historians surmise that. I've heard. Yes. Um, that's always a possibility. Sure. Uh, whether that's true or not, whether he was confident enough in his own, so he went on then to form his own anthro anthro. I I always get that yeah. word. Sure I know that's a tr it's a trick word for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but he he did go on to do those things and yeah and yes. you know I do think in theosophy they seem to Madame Blavatsky she would talk a lot about how geometric patterns were really important yeah yeah so it's all it's all um and and you could see that when I looked at Hilma's work you could see that with the triangles and the other things that were that were going on with that 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 you have to kind of go into that almost um primal intelligence space Mm -hmm. Yes. For some of that. Mm -hmm. And one of the most interesting aspects of this, uh, these painting for the, paintings for the temple is that when she got the downloads to create the paintings, it was also supposed to be this, this work, the paintings for the temple were supposed to be displayed in a spiral temple 
Um, and that's where they were supposed to be presented. They would be covering the interior of a spiral temple. So what ended up happening is, um, well, I'm not sure how to jump forward in the story, but just remember that about the spiral temple. So, so she stops painting and then four years later, she comes back and starts um, picking up the project again, but she develops a different process. And now her process is more clairvoyant where when she does her work, she receives the messages and the information, but she herself executes them. So it's more like a, a seeing and hearing, like clairaudient, clair, clairvoyance, um, but through the channel of Hilma as an artist. So her work is for, so the, so the, the absolute controlled work is done after that period, but she keeps continuing making work her entire life and does not show the work. I, she shows her, she continues to show her other work. And at one time she actually shows her um, figurative landscape work in, the, in a show with Kandinsky, who is the considered the father of abstract expressionism is the first one to theorize abstract expressionism. But she doesn't, she, the only thing she does is in the 1920s, she brings a few of her paintings to London for a spiritual conference and that's it. And she writes in her notebooks that her, she understands that her work is not understood. So maybe it's partially that show because I think it's in the thirties when she starts to write in the notebooks that um, her work should be kept not seen until 20 years after her death. So she has the, so she comes to understand that the audience is not there for her work, that it is not understood and it's not the right time. So this is work for the future. <laughs> and so she dies in 1944 and she leaves all of her work uh, to her nephew. And so it's a fully intact collection of spirit art. We don't have a lot of that in the world. You know, once this got yeah. dismissed or denigrated, a lot of it was destroyed or lost. So she she had the presence of mind to save her work, like a in a time capsule. And she even went and she created notebooks that ex she has these intricate notebooks that are now out. Somebody has reproduced them, and you can buy her notebooks as a book um, that describes her systems, her ways of thinking of color. Um, what her work means. She wrote 20,000 words or 20,000 pages on her own spiritual um, ideas that she received. She had her uh, like fully realized that she put it all in order for, for the people of the future to digest. Beautiful. So um, her work not only stays 20 years, it's not seen again for 40 years. Um, in 1986, the book I showed earlier, she's in she's included in a show in in Los Angeles that reassesses abstract art and its spiritual properties because over time, the spirituality got cleansed from the abstract art story, the modernist story. The spirituality got taken out out, even though Kandinsky clearly states he was spiritually inspired. He wrote a book about it. Yes. <laughs> wrote a book about being inspired spiritually and that's why he did the art and oh. I was curious as to why or how it started and um a number of historians have noted that the Nazis were inspired by theosophy and they were also inspired by um a theory of odic force which could be um that one it could be akin to mesmerism as well mm -hmm. and but when I say inspired by theosophy, I say misinterpret or like take take their own ideas and kind of twist it through that lens. Sure. And so after after that, people wanted to distance themselves from the topics. That's part of what happened. Sure. I don't think that's the full reason why spirituality has been cleansed out of modern art. Like I, I think then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and 
as culture gets further away from spirituality or more more materialistic there's also a lot of as we know a lot of tension surrounding topics of spiritualism for people who aren't aware of its history or have never experienced it or you know think that houdini debunked media <laughs> all mediums or you know the 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 way I, I feel like there's a lot of misinformation about it I, I couldn't agree more. There's a lot of misinformation about those things. And I think it's important for, I'm so glad you mentioned that there was the societal pressure that pushed that under that idea underground. And I do feel that the, to the rise of atheism or what people are actually agnostic, agnostic jumping into atheism, <laughs> you know, um, that they, they got very confused about it. And I do feel it's one of the big reasons that Kandinsky decided to move out of Russia mm. because at that time he was having a, a hard time with people um, not liking the spiritual elements. Mm -hmm associated with his art and so he then he's like okay I've, I've got to move this out of this country because the you know communism was taking hold mm -hmm. and the the idea of connection with god was definitely not supported in in that regime mm -hmm. of, of thinking so i think that's one of the reasons he he wanted to make sure that that his art could be preserved in that in that sacred context and I'm, I'm glad that he that he did that. But I, I want to I was hoping you could tell me, uh, do you know what might might have happened with the five, the, the ladies uh, that Hilma off Clint and the other ladies, you know, she she stepped away from doing the work and, you know, Rudolf Steiner and her and her mother being ill and all of those things. But do you know what ended up happening to the five? Um, she was lifelong friends. Um with at least one of them and mm -hmm. corresponded, but I don't, I think after that, she's the, the five ended as well. And she the just five ended. ended because she wasn't, she wasn't going to work toward that and sustain yeah, it anymore. She, she, so she just worked solitarily. So maybe we should get, uh, give people a little, a little bit of understanding in terms of what Helma Afklin's art looks like oh, yes. so that they have a sense of what she was bringing to the table with spirit, especially, do you, do you have some things that you could tell uh, about in, in the work she did with the five, but then also the after when she was just straight clairvoyance? Yes, so first I'll, I'll explain um, this book. So this is, this is the book that I um, have of a recent, her most recent exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum. Now this relates to what I, teased out earlier about the, the spiral temple. Yes. So she always envisioned, you know, that this channeled work was supposed to be in the spiral temple. And so one of her, her, her first huge retrospective in the United States was at the Guggenheim Museum, which was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, which is a huge white spiral. And when she had this exhibition, her paintings were up on the walls and people walked around to see them in a spiral. So her vision came true. Um, yes. and, and very, um, I was very surprised and amazed to see the Guggenheim not shy away from this uh, and put it in the wall text and acknowledge her, her true spirituality and her vision of the temple and how synchronistic it was no matter what you believe, um, meaning like for all audiences, they were acknowledging that she had envisioned it being in this temple and now here it is in the Guggenheim. And why I say that is because, you know, I lived in New York for 15 years. And when I first moved there in 2005, I would go to museums and see some spiritualist art hanging on the walls, but devoid of the context. It would be put in the outsider art area or like be presented as abstraction and I there's, there's works that I've seen of people in trance where it was that part of the work was not acknowledged in its context it was presented in well just as a side note for people you know when you first told me about Helma a couple of years ago I looked her up on Wikipedia 
And before this particular show, when I when I asked you, would you come on to Wednesday's Movement and talk about Helma Afklin, I was looking at, at the Wikipedia page for her, completely different. Before they didn't have, it was much shorter, they didn't have the, the spiritual context of her art. It has filled in just within the last couple of years with lots of understanding in terms of the spiritual nature of her work and why that became a transcendent space for abstract uh, art it, itself. So I thought that was beautiful. And it, some, sometimes people have to take hold of that. And, and probably because someone at that Guggenheim was really in, in, in the awareness of spirit, I would assume. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so this is the catalog for that show. And I should mention that so the show opened, I'm, you know, I don't want to get the date wrong. I think it was 2019, um, early in 2019. Um, and it was the most uh, attended exhibition ever in the history of the Guggenheim. And this catalog is the most, is the best selling catalog the Guggenheim has ever produced. So Hilma was correct. <laughs> and knowing that her audience would be in the future. And I myself, I was able to see the show. I think I went like six times. I got, <laughs> I got um, a membership to the Guggenheim and I was able to, there was a day long conference about Hilma F. Clint's work that I was able to attend. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really special um, to be in New York at that time when the Hilma show was there. And so the catalog reproduces a, a lot of her work, but, um, I guess I'll just show a few of the paintings for the temple. I mean, well, here's part of her, here's one of her channel works. And so you can see that this one is called um, one of the biggest, uh, the, some of the biggest paintings they go, they're supposed to represent different stages of life. So that's childhood. Um, this is youth. The vibrancy. So this is um, this is adulthood. There's another adulthood, and these were these paintings are absolutely huge, and they were all in the same room on the bottom floor. So you, and I, I'm pretty sure the Guggenheim has install shots so you could see what that show was like. And then this is old age. So these are some of the channeled, um, you know, she was pictorially showing the energies of each stage of life in, the, in these. And, and, and symbolically represented. Right. And the colors probably chosen are significant as well. Yes. She probably has it written down at some point. It's, it's somewhere. It sounds like she's a person who, who really knew how to <laughs> make sure that there were anecdotal notes associated with the, the work, it sounds like. That she was and here's some, of the early, that. here's some of the early um, drawings of the five, automatic drawings. So you can see where the, you, you know, you could see the inspiration or, you know, like the early blueprints of those. So in this Guggenheim book that you from from that particular show, it actually addresses the spiritual nature of her work. Then, yes, the um, all of the wall text on the the show was exact on her bio. So and did they talk about how they decided to do this? How this was discovered, and then how long it took them to get this show curated? In that sense. I don't remember that. Part. Because I was wondering who, if, if there's a certain person or a certain group that was responsible for getting this into the light. Because um, I'm kind of curious as to, as to who put that forward, like the, the discovery of her, it's like discovering a new land, right? Um, the, the curator is Tracy, Tracy Bashkoff. Mm -hmm. And um, she's, she wrote, um, she writes an essay about, Hilma and also about the history of the Guggenheim being built and kind of how these the ideas correlate and how they come together in Hilma's exhibition. Beautiful. And um, 
so I don't know much about um, her as a curator, but she sure, is the sure. curator. Um, and, you know, at the, at the conference about Helen Lofklint's work, her, some of her family members were there and someone had made a comment about like, why do we have to include this spirituality stuff when you look at her work and they were like, because, and because <laughs> that's what it was and we want it honored. And she, she was very clear. She couldn't be more <laughs> clear about, you know, and then there was an art historian who said, as a historian, you don't have the luxury to take that out, even if you want to, you know, so that there still was people in the room uh, who wanted to cl cleanse or lessen this aspect of her work. Now, when you say family members, are you, did she end up having children then? No, or no, no. She, she left. shoots of of siblings and things no she I, I believe she was celibate her whole life that's what and I was so I assumed you know but then I you no. they get to say no, these she, <laughs> she left her work to her nephew and then her ah, nephew's okay. son inherited it so there were several of her family members there I don't know who who they were right. but they must have been um from her nephew who is like i think he's in he was had a big hand in the exhibition oh good good so that he he wanted to make sure that was brought he, so it sounds like he helped to bring that to the light yes, yes that's good and so um i'll try to find one of the figurative they make a point um to show you the differences but yeah, it's a great book. Oh, this is one of my favorites too. This is um, one of the altar pieces. Yes, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> yes, beautiful. So this is done later after she um, changes her. Now, when you say that they were big paintings, can you say how big that might have been? Like, um, was that the size of like a like a carpet rug or the whole wall? Well, I, yeah, according to this book, it's 237.5 by 179.5 centimeters. Ooh, yeah. I have to look we're, we're, we're not a metric country. <laughs> yeah, it's in metrics. These are, um, these are some of the early works where she was working figuratively, but not um, as she would if she was normally working, you know, it's as, I'll show some of her, some of her, um, yeah, so this is, these are some figurative works that she did when she oh, was, wow. so, so you can see how different. Yeah, so she really has a, a grasp of realism mm -hmm. and uh, of the abstract, so she, she's a dual purpose artist. Right, so the exciting thing is that now that this has happened, a lot of people are reassessing all of art history and looking into Hilma and trying to find more artists like this. And uh, because her her abstraction predates Kandinsky's work. Isn't and, it by like 50 years or something? Um, like no, hers is, uh, I think four mm -hmm. years, but there's, four, a, oh, okay. there's a different um, artist who's recently come into you know, she's being shown again, and her name is Georgiana Houghton, and she was a famous spiritualist in England. I mean, she hung out with Daniel Douglas Holm and um, oh, awesome. the who's who. Of, and yeah. she, she did a lot of spirit photography experiments with Frederick Hudson. And so she was well known, but she was well known um, in the spiritualist circles, but her art was um not is now being recently like re-acknowledged so she her works predate kandinsky by 50. oh that's the one that's 50. Yeah. yeah that's 50. yeah and then you know there's debate on how abstract she is and, and all art historians are looking at her to recategorize her but um her, her works are incredible and they're obviously wow spirit inspired definitely as yes. that spirit artist inspired work so she's being um 
reassessed and re-acknowledged and, um, and why her work is still present in the world is because one of the oldest spiritualist organizations in Australia held onto it. Ooh. So they kept it they, and, and the College of Psychic Studies kept some of her work. So that's how it got to us because, you know, the spiritualists cared for it. That's and right. now, now a broader audience is interested in it. So these spiritualist archives, these, these idiosyncratic archives, like let's say like the Lily Dell Museum has stuff that they're keeping for posterity. You that's know, right. that, that's what's making this, this material get to us now. True. So spiritualists have saved this. That's right. Otherwise, it would be lost to you know antiquity. <laughs> so, right. But it's almost like you become a, an art archaeologist, right? Yes. To yes. Uncover these things, these special, um, the special spiritual framework. I love that you explained that Hilma went into trance to do automatic painting there are people in in modern times that do this mm -hmm. uh, usually you see them as spiritists rather than spiritualists but there yes. are people that do the clairvoyant art the, the spirit artist work there there are a few people that uh, become more prominent in modern times that work in that um in that medium, haha, ha. <laughs> the artist medium world. And so it's beautiful that this has come to light and that it is, it's changing. It, it kind of, it, that's how history is. It, it kind of gets rocked a little bit. Right. On and its it, axis. it also um, makes uh, Lily Dell's collection, especially, you know, the beautiful uh, spirit paintings of the Bang Sisters. And, oh, yeah. you know, that, that are there, I mean, it, this is, so, you know, it's a connected, uh, you know, history. And sure. it's amazing that Lily Dell has kept all of those beautiful paintings, those spirits. And, and it, it just shows we need to make sure we, we preserve that which has gone before us because we do stand on the shoulders of giants, people who have worked so hard and so diligently to produce a lasting understanding of spiritual principles to really and in a in a very personal way prove it to themselves and to others that spirit communication and connection with the divine is possible and that it can happen in these profound ways. And I think it's so exciting that it, it showed up in art. It has shown up in scientific invention. It has shown up in uh, music. There are so many reasons. I, I was reading how Kandinsky was, um, he would listen to music and it would bring out more in terms of his own understanding of producing spiritual art in an abstract way. So I, there are things that even probably just talking about this on, on the show today will inspire people to maybe sit down with a paintbrush or sit down in, in some other mode to produce creatively and see what happens artistically within them when they're in the mode of spirit communication. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely possible. Yeah, I, I, I want to, if, are there some last thoughts you wanted to share about Helma before we tell them about uh, some of the other great things that you're going to be doing soon? Um, yeah, I mean, just that uh, I'm so, it's an exciting time uh, to, to be interested in these topics. Be, and, and it's exciting for me to see um, to see this interest in the broader culture um, and to see histories being reassessed because one of the reasons I got so enthralled with my own work in Lilydale was because I was realizing in like 2001 how disconnected from culture and their, their intellectual and social history that spiritualism had kind of been written out and so I just think it's really an exciting time for spiritualism to be re-looked at and reassessed and renewed interest. And I think that's good for Lilydale too. And um, 
It's think- good for the world so that they don't just think of the world as a secular place, that there's a sacred context, the underpinnings of our world that we can uh, associate with. And I think perhaps the people who may- maybe didn't like abstract art before, yeah. they may have a new appreciation of it especially if they're someone who looks at things from that spiritual perspective the next time they they go to um, a gallery that is showing Hilma's work or one of the other artists that is on of that spiritual mindset they'll go wow that's deep and profound and invokes an epiphany of sorts within me or a resonance of of agreement and it, it, agreement and spiritual connection that can happen in those moments because I I do you feel that with Hilma Hilma's work one of the big reasons she wanted to make sure it was done was not just you know proof of continuity of life or spirit contact but to really help other people transcend by looking at it right by interacting with the art isn't that something that yeah. is so about abstract art to begin with Yes, and it actually one of the curators in this book notes that like they really should be experienced. Like being in the physical space with these paintings was an experience in and of itself, and that was the intention of the work. So, um, you know, when the world is back and we can go to museums again and hopefully we can (laughs) Uh, If you have the chance to see Hilma's work, I would absolutely encourage it. And also in Buffalo near Lilydale, there's the Albright Knox Gallery, which, you know, is a modernist temple. I mean, they have one of the best uh, collections of modern art. And so going there and seeing and finding the spiritual connections to that work, which has long been not associated with it you know because when i when i first was learning about abstract art way back when as a, as a school child i thought well that's interesting but then you started to learn about the shock value that people were going more for shock value to get fear or horror or rage out of a person mm. by using art because you could do that right mm-hmm. but then there's this other art like Hilma's art that is there to make people go into a deeper spiritual mode of questioning, mm-hmm. not, not to have a fear, but to have a, a divine beauty attachment. I can get on board with that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of institutions and historians have written out this uh, chapter to um, these associations for many artists. And a lot of artists censored themselves too because it was, of, it was very yeah. sad yeah so hopefully that they will feel uh, that when they are making truly profound art that they don't have to hide that anymore in that spiritually profound way that it can uh, help people to get into that mode of higher way and higher thinking for themselves so beautiful well, I know you you wanted um, you have some things that are coming up. I know you're working on a book, another book. <laughs> Tell yes, us about I book. am working on another book, and it's <clears throat> this book is not of my own work. It is a historical uh, project, which I hope will bring um, an untold story into the world. It, it's uh, it's based on. The man, uh, John G. Neihard, who wrote Black Elk Speaks, he was a famous famous poet. He was the poet laureate of Nebraska. He was, uh, he wrote epic poems about the West and the history of uh, Native American Indian culture. He was a huge, uh, Black Elk Speaks is, is, I think it's the most, well, most read, most famous book about Native American Indian culture. And well, not very many people know that towards the end of his life in the 1960s, he started an experimental seance group and it was called Surratt and the S-O-R-R-A-T, which standed for, stands for the Society for Research on Rapport and Telekinesis. Whew. And so Neihardt has his own ideas about um, seance situations that 
they could be built up by a genuine rapport and strength of um, interaction between people. He believed in the unity of all things. He called himself a pragmatic mystic. Um, and Nyhart truly believed that if we could learn something about mind over matter, that bringing that into the world would be akin to discovering fire or the wheel. Like he, so he really came at it with a noble intention. And he started a, he started a group and then after this Sorak group, after he died, they continued on for almost 50 years. And they left an archive and they left an archive of photos. So my, my book will be a lot of the photographs that they took of their activities. But it is, it is a very complicated story and it's one of the strangest stories too in the history of psychical research. They were studied by a lot of people and a lot of that didn't go well. You know, there's a lot of tension between science and spirituality. And even when you have this noble goal, there you can't cleanse the humanity from these practices in order to prove them that you get you get stuck. So there's a like a lot of lessons in this work and um, uh, some of the pictures have been shown before in, uh, there was a famous spirit photography show in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and four of the pictures were shown there. But other than that, these are the, the rest have never been seen. So I'm really excited about this. Wow, so here we go. Another archeological dig for you <laughs> in terms of, of, the, of bringing spirit communication to the light. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, and I'm in, I'm in the Thank very, you very early stages. So um, the date is not set and um, the book's still being um, outlined, but it's definitely in the works. And so when I'm further along, I'd love to come back and- Oh, absolutely. We're having you back you on. All, Let's tell you all about to talk about that. That's, that's yeah. gonna be a fantastic book as well. And Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's a, it's a real thing. honor to be working on it because this is 50 years of people's lives doing this. I mean, it's very intense research. It's really astounding. And, and so and I, they, are, there, are there recordings and writings of these things then, or how did they, did, how did they meet? Um, they would meet, Just they have curiosity. pictures, there, there's notebooks, okay. there's no books. Um, okay. several books have been written. Um, okay. But again, it kind of got lost in the shuffle. Once, yeah. yeah, once you're, you know, they, once you're not successful in proving beyond a reasonable doubt, and then uh, you get accused, they were accused of fraud and denigrated and, um, but they kept trying because they really believed that they were doing something worthwhile. So it's really an honor for me to help put it out in the world for people to see more of it and to we, we, we can learn something about the study of spiritualism and um, hopefully from this work. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and one of the things that you've been able to do over the years, uh, you've brought in different thoughts, like we were talking about in terms of the summertime. You're, you've always researched and networked with people so that you could bring their thoughts to a, a bigger stage and, and to Lilydale especially. So tell people a little bit about that program that's coming up for the summer time. Okay, they... great. Yes, so it my the program is called The Science of Things Spiritual and it's had many iterations. It first started uh, as the collaboration with Susan Barnes in 2015. And one year it was at the library once a week and one year it was at the, her spirit art gallery. And Thank you. The, for the past several years, it's been at Assembly Hall as a day long, uh, like a, a marathon of conferences. But the idea was, you know, as I was doing my own research, I was meeting scholars and academics who were reassessing spiritualist history or related topics. But many of them had never been to Lilydale or some of them had never even met a spiritualist. And then when I would go to Lilydale, I would say, I went to this conference and there people are doing all this new research about the history and people hadn't heard about it because it was going on at academic conferences. So the idea is to bridge together theory and practice in yes. this day. So a little bit for everybody. Not, it's, not, it's not too academic. It's, it's meant for 
like learning about it in an interesting way. And I've had so many interesting speakers and we do visual day, day of visual uh, presentations. And um, it's something I really love doing and hopefully we'll be back in person this year in Lilydale, July 31st. Great. So mark your calendars, everyone, so that you can get on board for that because Shannon really does her, her best to put together such a beautiful program of people and, and speakers and, and topics of, of unearthing things that we may have uh, not found in a long, long time that we need to look at in today's light. Now, I also want to mention that um, uh, I, my, I have a mediumship development circle that's starting um, Monday, Monday, March 1st. If people want to be part of my mediumship development circle, uh, we're not going to uh, be focused uh, on the, doing things the way the five did, <laughs> but we will focus on development of mediumship, much in the same style of, as of Shannon and I grew up in those development circles. So people will have an opportunity to practice with other people and give and receive messages and really grow in their spiritual unfoldment and their mediumship. So you can find out more about that on my particular website, willowwhite.com and sign up for things. So you can join me for the circle. It's, it's the next five Mondays uh, in March. So we're going to make March all about mediumship. <laughs> and I will highly recommend you attend if you're thinking of because I know you're a great teacher, Willa. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> so, so join me if you can. And then I want to tell people for next week, we're going to talk about the spiritual essence of food. My guest will be Jessamine Daly Griffin, and she is a, a wonderful um uh, baker and friend who who is really had some amazing spiritual experiences with food and with running her business especially during this COVID time so i encourage you if you want to be inspired about how spirit can work in your life and in, in everyday matters and make miracles happen tune in next week on wednesdays with willa at 10 a.m so you can uh, take part in that and then the following week after that i'll have colin bates on he's a medium from the UK. We're going to talk about healing grief through mediumship. So a lot of great shows to come. I hope you can tune in. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Shannon. Thank you for I, having me. I had the best time uh, re reacquainting myself with Hilma's work in preparation. And I encourage uh, everyone to seek out uh, either the books or, or reading about her. Or and so there are probably some great biographies that have come out of this. Um, do you have a favorite one? Because I know someone was asking about biographies. Real quick um, there's uh, the most recent uh, um, biography is by Julia Voss. And I, I saw her speak and, I, and she's been working hard at work uh, for a long time on this new oh. biography of Hilma. Great. And so, yes. Yeah, so Great. So people can check that biography out and really maybe look for themselves at Hilma's work and see what happens when you meditate with art and with other forms of art as well. And then making that creative force uh, generate within you too. So really beautiful. You can find Shannon on shannontaggart.com and she is an artist, an author, and I can't wait to have you on the show again uh, in the you. next few months. <laughs> I'm looking forward. I'm very much looking forward. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in today. God bless and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.